Hello everyone and welcome to the 7 student. Today we're doing C1.2, which is cell respiration in IB biology. So, getting started, what's the point of cell respiration? Well, okay, so the point is to make ATP. What is ATP? ATP is the energy currency of the cell. It's basically used for temporary storage of energy and to transfer energy between processes and different parts of the cell. That's why it's called the energy currency. Same way as with a euro or a dollar, you get to buy many different things and sell many different things. Same goes for ATP. So what makes it suitable for this role? Well, first of all, it's soluble in water, so it can move through the cytoplasm. It's stable at neutral pH, which is the pH in the cytoplasm, and it cannot move through the phospholipid bilayer, so its movement can be controlled using pumps. Structure-wise, you can see it's a nucleotide, right? Just like the ones we find in DNA or RNA, so it has a ribose. Uh, it also has an adenine, a base, right? And it has three phosphate groups over here. As we'll see, this is the key to the energy currency. It's these three phosphate groups. Let's see why. So as you can see here, basically, ATP, so adenosine triphosphate, right, has three phosphate groups. This is a charged battery. This is one that has energy in it you can then break the bond between one of these phosphate groups and you get ADP, so adenine diphosphate. Basically, you lose one phosphate and in the process you release energy. So that can be the dead battery, right? Um, and then you can go again from ADP to ATP. Okay, what's this required for? So this release of energy, this making ADP from ATP, it's used for macromolecule synthesis, first of all. Uh, so, for example, linking glucoses together uh, to form starch requires uh, ATP. Also for active transport, so pumping particles across a membrane when it's a against the concentration gradient requires ATP. And finally, movements. So components of cells need to be moved around all the time, and sometimes cells themselves have to move. So, for example, phagocytes need to move to sites of infection, or muscle cells need to contract. All of these processes require ATP. They require breaking ATP into ADP. That releases a small amount of energy, but it's sufficient for these processes. Okay, good. So how are we actually making ATP from ADP, right? Because it requires energy, we've said. Okay, well, we do cell respiration. So this is the entire topic that we're covering today. How do we make ATP? Okay, I really want you to remember that that's the ultimate goal here. So cell respiration is performed by all living cells. That's really important, okay? I recommend you watch this with the video we're going to release next week on photosynthesis because they couple very well together. But plants also do cell respiration, okay? Because that's a common mistake. So in animals, carbon compounds from the food we eat are oxidized to release energy, and that energy is used to produce ATP, okay? So basically, the food we eat is used to make ATP. In plants, they don't eat. So basically, photosynthesis happens beforehand to make these carbon compounds, and then these carbon compounds are used for the same purpose as in animals, to make ATP, okay? So you can see the importance of cell respiration, right? Uh, it's one of the main reasons why we eat, right, to produce ATP. Okay, um, so in most cases, respiration is going to use oxygen, important, and it's going to produce carbon dioxide, CO2. So this is the reason why we breathe, right, and gas exchange occurs. Uh, gas exchange and cell respiration are interdependent, okay? Uh, that makes sense because, okay, so if in cell respiration we're requiring oxygen, we need to breathe it in, right? And if we're releasing CO2, that needs to leave somehow, and that is through the process of cell respiration. One requires the other. Okay, so now that we know all of this, it makes sense that the rate of cell respiration, okay, can be determined from measurements such as oxygen uptake or carbon dioxide production. And this can be measured with things like a respirometer, okay? This is a little aside, but it's important that you know it's in the syllabus. So to calculate the actual rate, you can, for example, measure uh, oxygen uptake and then divide the volume of oxygen used over the amount of time. Okay, hopefully that's clear. Moving on. There's two main types of cell respiration. So we have aerobic which basically uses oxygen, and anaerobic, which does not use oxygen. So that's the main definition, right? Um, so the lungs and the blood system respiration give oxygen to most organs rapidly enough for aerobic respiration. 
Uh, however, sometimes anaerobic respiration has to be used um, in muscles if ATP supply needs to be very, very quick. Uh, for example, this is necessary uh, when escaping a predator or to catch prey, right? Because you're running really, really fast and you need really, really quick supply of ATP, which cannot be produced through aerobic respiration. You're basically not getting enough oxygen uh, to produce the ATP you need. Nowadays, there's not much escaping from predators, right? So it's most often used during high intensity exercise, such as weightlifting or running. You might be asking, why not always just do anaerobic respiration? It would really save uh, us from having to breathe oxygen in. Well, importantly, anaerobic respiration produces lactate, okay? And there's a limit to the amount of lactate that the human body can tolerate. So uh, actually lactate needs to be broken down by oxygen itself, which is why after anaerobic respiration, it can take several minutes for enough oxygen to be absorbed to break down the lactate. So basically it's an issue with the product of anaerobic respiration is toxic, okay? That's why you can only sprint for so long, right? Until the lactate accumulates and it reaches toxic levels and you need to stop. Okay, so just to summarize, aerobic respiration uses oxygen. You can use a lot of compounds as substrates and you have CO2 and water as waste products. And you have a really, really high yield of ATP per glucose. In anaerobic, the yield is much, much lower but it can be used when there's no oxygen, which is an advantage if you're doing very, very intense physical exercise. And lactate, which is a toxic product, is released. Okay, so that's it for the standard level ones. So congrats. <laughs> for the higher level, we still have a lot to go through. So now we're going to look at how uh, cell respiration actually occurs. But before we do that, it's important to understand what NAD is, okay? So First of all, those of you who do chemistry, you definitely know this, but those of you who don't, you probably don't. So oxidation is a chemical reaction in which a molecule loses electrons, okay? And reduction is a chemical process where a molecule gains electrons. And they always occur together because basically the electrons that one molecule loses are the electrons that the other molecule gains, okay? In cellular respiration, the key player here is NAD, okay, which is short for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. <laughs> so NAD is an electron carrier, so it can lose and accept electrons reversibly, basically reduce and oxidize itself reversibly. So in its starting form, NAD+, plus, right, it's ready to pick up electrons. During cell respiration, a molecule loses two hydrogen atoms, and then each hydrogen carries an electron and a proton, right? So NAD plus is going to accept two electrons and one of the protons, and it's going to become NADH. Uh, this is also, you'll hear to this referred as reduced NAD. Both are the same thing, important to note. Okay, so in essence, NAD is the carrier that shuttles electrons and hydrogen around during the energy producing reactions in our cells. Okay, that's all you need to remember now. Basically, you get this new hydrogen and the two electrons go to form this covalent bond over here. Okay, you'll see that both NAD and ATP are very important in cell respiration. Good, so how do we start? Okay, well, regardless of whether we're doing aerobic or anaerobic respiration, the first step is called glycolysis, okay? So it uses glucose as a substrate and it happens in the cytoplasm of cells. Keep note of where things happen. They ask about that a lot and it changes a lot. Um, so this happens in the cytoplasm. So it's going to produce a small yield of ATP, but it doesn't use oxygen. So we're going to go through several steps. The first is phosphorylation. Glucose is phosphorylated twice. That requires ATP, as you can see here. Then there's lysis. So it's broken down into two. Then there's oxidation, uh, where the two molecules are oxidized by removing hydrogen. And that's accepted by NAD plus to form NADH. And don't remember, you don't need to remember all of these details. And then finally, we have ATP formation. So basically, four ATPs are produced as the phosphates in the molecule, right, um, get transferred to ADP. And finally, the end product is pyruvate. You do need to remember that. So as a result of glycolysis, one glucose is converted into two pyruvates. Two NADs are converted to NADH, or reduced NAD, and there is a net yield of two ATPs. This is the key outcomes to remember. Each step requires a different enzyme in this pathway, right? Uh, remember, if you saw the previous topic, enzymes are specific, right? So that's why. Good. What comes next? So 
Now we diverge into two pathways, right? We've done glycolysis. Now it's a matter of, is there enough oxygen or not? Let's look first at the case where there's not enough oxygen. Then we're going to do anaerobic respiration, okay? So in anaerobic respiration, there's no way to make more ATP. So the goal of the next steps is actually to allow glycolysis to keep working. Because remember, glycolysis gives us a small yield of ATP. So what do we need for glycolysis to continue occurring? You can go back and look at the diagram, but basically we need glucose, we need ADP, and we need NAD. So glucose is not going to run out as long as there are stores in the cell, right? We really can't control that without eating more. ADP only runs out if it's all in ATP form, right? In which case there's no need to carry out glycolysis in the first place. Uh, we're good, right? But NAD will run out unless it is regenerated by uh, taking NADH and oxidizing it, so turning it back to NAD. So basically, in anaerobic respiration, what we do is we take pyruvate and we convert it into lactate, right? Uh, that uses reduced NAD, so it converts it into NAD+, plus, and this can go back into, into glycolysis. You can see the whole pathway here. Um, therefore, the only limiting factor in anaerobic respiration is lactate, the toxic byproduct, okay? Now, anaerobic respiration is a little different in yeast. Basically, it's very similar. It's The goal is to produce NAD. But uh, instead of uh, lactate, we produce ethanol and CO2. So this is called ethanol or alcoholic fermentation. So it's used in baking and brewing. Uh, it uses yeast, right? We use yeast. And basically, after all the oxygen is consumed, the yeast are going to do anaerobic respiration. So in baking, the CO2 produced creates bubbles of air, causing the dough to rise. And then in brewing, ethanol makes things like grape juice or barley into alcohol right through this ethanol so ethanol is alcohol right so that's explains why these things are used in industry great now what if we do have oxygen so in that case pyruvate can be oxidized to carbon dioxide and water the first step to do so is called the link reaction so the link reaction links <laughs> glycolysis to further steps in aerobic respiration so what we do is first we do decarboxylation and then oxidation or dehydrogenation um, and CO2 attaches, right, which is an acetyl group and the product is called acetyl-CoA. Um, that's very important that you remember this name, acetyl-CoA. And this happens, okay, this whole process happens in the matrix of the mitochondria. So remember glycolysis in the cytoplasm, this happens in the matrix of the mitochondria. Okay, good. So what happens next? After the link reaction has happened, right, these acetyl groups, the acetyl-CoA, are oxidized, and that's known as the Krebs cycle. So we have a pathway that's a cycle. It goes back and back and back and back in a circle. So this is happening in the matrix of the mitochondria as well. Okay, take notes. So the first product is going to be citrate, right, which comes from basically substituting coenzyme A by oxaloacetate over here. Citrate is then converted back to oxaloacetate through a series of reactions. But basically, the key points to remember here is that we're regenerating NADH, right? And uh, we have CO2 as a waste product, and we're creating ATP. So we're making one ATP per cycle. We're making three NADHs and one FADH. Uh, don't I'll worry about FADH. It's basically the same thing as NADH, just a different form. And we're also releasing CO2 as a waste product. This is setting us up for the next step, which is the electron transport chain. All right. So this is the final step. I know this is a hard topic. I do recommend rewatching this. But okay, so what's happening in the electron transport chain? So we've made all of our NADH, all of our um, FADH, right? And now it's a matter of assembling it all together to make as much ATP as possible. So this is going to happen in the inner mitochondrial membrane, okay? That's very, very, very important. So the inner mitochondrial membrane, which you can see here, has groups of proteins, and they act as electron carriers. So that's why it's called the electron transport chain. So what's going to happen is the first carrier over here accepts a pair of electrons from reduced NADH. Remember, we've made these before, so now we get the reduced NADH, and we make it into NAD, and electrons are released in the process, right? Then this electron is going to pass from carrier to carrier, jumping down, and when an electron jumps down, it releases energy. And that energy is going to be used to pump protons from the matrix of the mitochondria into the intermembrane space, so the space between the two membranes of the mitochondria, right? Protons accumulate here really, really quickly because it's a very, very small space. 
And then we can go down the concentration gradient through a protein called ATP synthase. Okay, so this is ATP synthase. So hydrogen atoms, protons, sorry, are just going to go down. And that causes ATP synthase to rotate. It's like a motor, okay? So it rotates, and in rotating, it turns ADP into ATP. This is called chemiosmosis, right? So this whole process is called chemiosmosis. So this is how we produce a lot of ATP. Finally, though, the electrons in the electron transport chain right after they've jumped, they need to go somewhere. So this is where oxygen comes in, okay? This is the whole reason why we're inhaling oxygen. Uh, so oxygen is called the terminal electron acceptor. It basically takes these electrons at the end and hydrogen protons from here, right? The ones that have, are going through and it makes water. However, what happens if there's no oxygen available, right? Then electrons are not going to be removed from the final carrier. So they stack up and mean that means that electrons cannot be accepted at the start of the electron transport chain. What does that mean? That means that reduced NAD, so NADH accumulates and therefore the link and the Krebs cycle stop since oxidations are not possible, right? Because we have no NAD to make into NADH. And this is when anaerobic respiration kicks in, okay, due to a lack of oxygen. However, the difference is instead of making 32 ATPs that we make here per molecule of glucose, we make two ATPs in anaerobic. Hope that's clear. I know this is a hard thing to understand. Take your time. And finally, we're going to look at the difference of using carbohydrates and lipids in respiration. So you can use both, but basically lipids have a much higher yield of energy, and that's due to them having less oxygen and more hydrogen and carbon, because hydrogen and carbon have a higher yield of energy in respiration. Also important to note, lipids you can't do anaerobic respiration with, because basically the first step in doing respiration with lipids is they are oxidized to acetyl group, to the acetyl-CoA. And those are fed directly into the Krebs cycle, so you can't make pyruvate, which you would need to do uh, anaerobic respiration, all right? Okay, so that's all for the content. Let's do some recap questions. So first, in aerobic respiration, which molecule is regenerated to allow glycolysis to continue? Pause now and think about it. And in three, two, and one... NAD+, plus. okay? Remember, this is the whole point of... Um, for glycolysis, we need NAD+, plus, right? So to allow it to continue, we need to regenerate it, right? And that's either done in the electron transport chain, uh, where we donate the electrons to the ETC, the electron transport chain, or in anaerobic respiration by producing um, lactate, okay? Next, within the mitochondria, which compound is produced through oxidation of fatty acids? Okay, and three, we just talked about this, and three, two, and one. Acetyl-CoA. Remember, we just mentioned that fatty acids, lipids, are oxidized to form acetyl-CoA. Not pyruvate, because then you could do anaerobic respiration, which you can't with lipids. Not acetylcholine, because that's a neurotransmitter. And not oxaloacetate, because that's a part of the Krebs cycle, right? That's But, like, it's the last thing in the Krebs cycle. Okay. And then finally, which process requires oxygen in aerobic cell respiration? Okay. In three, two, and one... Okay, so it's the accepting of electrons at the end of the electron transport chain. And remember, otherwise they accumulate, you can't uh, oxidize NADH, and you resort to anaerobic respiration. All right, I know this is a hard topic. Any questions, leave them in the comments. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe. It does help a lot. And I'll see you next week for photosynthesis. I do recommend you watch that, especially after this video. And thank you, everyone. Have a nice week.